Good afternoon and welcome to our live Hop Careers webinar. My name is Gareth Dace from Hertfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership. We work across all secondary schools in Hertfordshire with an aim of helping schools and students to learn more about future careers and employment opportunities. Each week we will focus on a different career and industry and I'm delighted to welcome you today to find out more about physiotherapy with Simon Shepherd, whom I'll introduce shortly. A bit of housekeeping first of all, just to reassure you, we cannot see or hear you, so I do know that there are 30 of you in attendance at the moment, um, but hopefully you can see and hear us. As the webinar goes on though, you will be able to interact and ask questions to Simon directly, and there's two ways that you can do this. Uh, so the first way is to type your question in uh, through the question tab on your dashboard. So if you expand that, you should see there's a little text box in there, then you can type that question in. That will only be visible to me, so it won't be visible to everyone else in attendance. And then I'll relay that question on to Simon to answer. Uh, the other way you can do that, if you're feeling a little bit brave, you can um, do something called raise your hand. So again, on your dashboard, uh, you should see there's something that looks like a hand icon. So if you click on that, that will alert me to the fact that you want to ask a question. Um, once you've done that, next opportunity will get I will introduce you and I'll take you off mute and then you'll be able to ask your question directly to Simon. At the end of the webinar, we, we will provide you with a QR code so you can access this webinar and you can watch it back again afterwards. And you'll also be able to watch any other um, webinars that we've run previously in the series and let you know details of any other ones that may be of reference of interest to you. So as mentioned, today's focus is on physiotherapy. So Simon Shepherd is a chartered physiotherapist who in his career has worked for the NHS, for private health organisations, and for the past 30 years, he has overseen player health and wellbeing and sports science at Lord's Cricket Ground. So hello, Simon, and thanks very much for joining us. Give everyone thanks, a wave. Guys. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Right. <clears throat> uh, so really just to set the scene, Simon, Starting from your school days, can you just take us through your career as a physiotherapist? Yeah, sure. So and school's a really interesting time for me because I, I managed to screw my ankle up pretty badly when I was at school. I, I, I would like to say it was on a uh, the rugby field or the football field, but I'm afraid it was just coming down the stairs a little bit too quickly and I, I, I just didn't quite land correctly. And I suffered quite a bad break and I I ended up having quite a lot of physiotherapy when I was about 16 or 17. And I think that ex sort of exposed me to the career uh, and made me think, well, actually, this is quite interesting. You know, I like people, I like sport, I like how the body functions. Um, so that sort of exposed me to the career. And I, I applied to uh, an establishment called St. Mary's Hospital, which is in Paddington, um, which was a teaching hospital because that's where most of the physiotherapy schools were in those days. Um, before they sort of moved into the universities. I did my degree, um, qualified, uh, and, and my first job was over at Central Middlesex Hospital, um, which is over in, in sort of northwest London. And I did what was called a rotational physiotherapy job, and I moved around with different sort of specialities, and you get a bit of a taste of things. And at the same time, you're specialising in, it, it, you're trying to build up your knowledge in a specialist area and build up your experience. And uh, uh, I went to work at a, a private hospital in the evenings. So in addition to working in the NHS, I'd go and work and do a clinic in a private hospital in the evenings, which would um, focus primarily on sports injuries. And then I, I, I'm going to be really honest, I just got very lucky. There was an advertisement in the in the newspaper for a job at Law's Cricket Ground. I love cricket. I thought getting a job back from, uh, sorry, a letter back from Lord saying no would be framed above my mantelpiece. So I applied for the job. Um, managed to get an interview somehow and and I, again I'm still not quite sure how I did it but I managed to get the job and in those days it was a department of one so it was just me all on my own two and a half years qualified and it was a steep learning curve um, so that's how I got into sports physiotherapy and in those days um, the cricket season was just simply a six month period in the summer. And that's the only work the physiotherapist was required for. We didn't sort of do much training in the off season. It's all changed now. So uh, in the winter, I was a bit bored and I realized this after a year. So as, as well as going back and doing the cricket the next year, I set up a private physiotherapy clinic and um, sort of built that up as well. So I, I had the, what I call the best of both worlds. I was lucky to be able to work in sport. Then I was also lucky to to work with what I would call the general population 
and both sides teach you so much about life and uh you know I'm, I'm been very lucky in my career to, to be exposed to the different areas yeah no okay and i mean you said there that you initially started doing on that rotation scheme and then you've you branched into sports physiotherapy but could you just explain the different areas of physiotherapy that someone could go into yeah sure so 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 a lot of people will think it's all it's all just sport because that's where we see it on the news and everything else but physiotherapists are you know involved in all aspects of healthcare so whether it's neurology which is people who might have helping people rehabilitate after they've had maybe a stroke or helping people function with sort of the diseases of the nervous system things like multiple sclerosis um it could be pediatrics you know helping to children and the development of, of children it could be um care of the elderly and with an increasingly elderly population you know the demands for that sort of role is is, is really important and there are physiotherapists who specialize in psychological illness, psychiatry. There'll be some who specialize in women's health, particularly sort of post-pregnancy. Um, and, you know, it's pretty relevant at the moment. There'll be some who specialize in the respiratory system and there will be working purely in intensive care units or people who are struggling with their, their heart and lungs. So it's a really wide, wide reaching profession. Yeah. No, oh, okay. And just to, just to reaffirm to everyone in attendance, um, do feel free to ask your questions in. I know we've had a few in. Um, Adam sent some questions in earlier, which uh, we'll co cover, I think, through the questions that we're going to ask. But anyone else that wants to ask them, uh, do drop them into the questions box now. You can type those in, then we can relay them on to um, onto Simon. Now, you, you, we've just spoken about the different types of sort, of sort of different genres of physiotherapy there are. What about those careers fields within sports science as a wider umbrella that have some connection to physiotherapy that maybe physiotherapy gives you a good starting building block to, to build from yeah and, and vice versa as well so it could be physiotherapy giving you a building block or those 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 other um uh, qualifications that might give you a building block in, in into physio so you know sports science you mentioned there gareth and that that has just over the last 20 years has just rocketed when I was sort of applying for university, there might have been three or four sports science courses up and down the country. I think it's now pretty much every single university. Um, so sports science is definitely one. Sports therapy, if you're more interested in the therapeutic side of things. Um, sports therapy is a really interesting qualification that sort of brings together um, a little bit of what a physio does and a little bit about a personal trainer does. It sort of looks at the exercise and the rehab side, but then also sort of looks at, at the therapeutics. And I think there are other sort of degrees that are closely aligned. You know, the obvious ones would be things like occupational therapy, nursing, medicine, even. Um, and then one or two that might not be things like psychology. You know, physiotherapists, we, we, we treat bodies traditionally and psychology sort of treats brain. But we, we now realise that body and brains are so closely interlinked that I know as a physiotherapist, I'm sometimes working on what's going on up here. And we also know that physical activity and exercise and good functional living is really important for the brain. So it works both ways. So I think psychology is a really interesting um, one to consider as well when you're looking at careers, if you're interested in this sort of area. Yeah, okay. you know, we've, we've had some really good questions that have just come in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go straight to sure. them. Um, so the question has, and a couple of these are, are connected or related. So we have one here from Daniel. Do you have to study biology at A level to study to be a physiotherapist or can you do a foundation year if you haven't studied it? And then related to that one from um, Rhiannon, what specific qualifications are necessary for physiotherapy and what was your degree in? Okay, so I when I studied, I'd, I'd go from back to front, and if I leave any of the questions out, you just remind me, Gareth, or leave any else. Yeah. So back to front. So when I studied, it wasn't a degree; it was something called a postgraduate diploma. So I did a three-year course, and I ended up with a postgraduate diploma. Um, over the last twenty years, and remember, I qualified in nineteen eighty-eight, um, but over the last twenty years, it's now all degree-based. In terms of what you will need, biology is preferable, but there will be all, there will be institutions that will accept people without biology. But you will need to demonstrate um, some aptitude towards a science. So I think if someone turns up with sort of biology, physics, and maths, that would go tick 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 tick. We love those as a group of subjects. However, 
physiotherapy isn't just about science. Um, and, and I think if someone turned up with sort of biology, um, history, and English, because you've shown an aptitude to a science, but also an aptitude to other subjects that provide analysis, you, you shouldn't be put off. There will, there'll be some organizations that will be a little bit more picky and will want maybe two, two sciences. There'll be some that, that maybe one will, will, will be fine. And I think in terms of the, the sort of actual qualifications, the number of points you need, because I think that's what they talk about these days, it is sort of 128 and then up from there, roughly. So about 128 points at A level um, it is what organisations will be looking for. If I remember all the bits of the question there. Yeah, no, I, I think you, I think you did, and I suppose just to clarify, um, as an employer yourself, um, yeah, what are you looking for on somebody's CV? I'm looking for someone who's really got an explorative mind, more than anything else. I, you know, physiotherapy is a little bit like detective work. You know, you've got someone who comes in, and I've got pain, and you, in many ways, you've got to work out where that's coming from. Certainly in my field of musculoskeletal, which is sort of, um, you know, bones and joints and ligaments and tendons, I've got to work out where's the source of that pain. Now, sometimes it's really obvious. So, OK, I twisted my ankle this afternoon and you've got it on film because you're at a sports club. You know exactly what happened. But it's incredible how many people come and go, oh, I just got just got a bit of a twinge in my back or my, my neck stiffened up. And it, we don't treat necks. We don't treat backs. We, we, don't, we, we try and get a little bit more specific so the detective work of what's really going on so exploratory mindset really critical for me and so if someone's demonstrated that they've been prepared to push their mind and maybe gone outside of their comfort zone that's a that that's something that i look for yeah no okay um, and related to this one i'm not sure whether you can answer this one alone or more of a general but lewis comes up with a very interesting question um that is due to the current situation of you know sort of covid and students mm -hmm. not doing the actual exams that they've been preparing so long for do you think this is something it will employers take this into consideration um when interviewing students or for, or for you in the discipline that you're looking at do you absolutely need to see that that um level of education or that academic level uh, threshold has been reached okay so i'm going to be straight i'm not an expert in exactly what's going on in covid education and i'm not sure anyone is but i'll give you my thoughts so i think there has to be an acceptance by universities that there has been an interruption in people's uh progression through their schooling um and i think that's well whether it's exactly the same across the board who knows but that will be taken into account okay without a doubt we are going to need physiotherapists to help populate the health service so this is not something that universities are going to be going oh we need to drop the numbers down they'll be wanting people to come and study this you know this is governments we're wanting more people in these sort of paramedical professions without a doubt as an, once you've got to university and hopefully you do well and you get your degree, that entitles you to become a member of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. And being able to call yourself a chartered physiotherapist is a bit like being a chartered accountant. It's a professional title. Now, you're not allowed to call yourself a, a chartered physiotherapist unless you've got that degree. So when people turn up for an interview with me they will all be chartered they're, they're not going to get an interview unless they have that bit of paper but i have to say once someone walks in the door and i interview them i'm not so interested in the bit of the paper i'm interested in the person i'm interested in what you've got to offer the organization and yeah. as an employer i enjoy learning from you in the same way that you might learn from me yeah well okay no no good answer thanks for getting lots of questions coming through and we will ask answer all of them um pearl i'm going to come back to your question in a in a moment because it will link into a conversation we're going to have but i think one, uh, one more on the qualifications um is it more common for institutes to want two sciences or is one more often enough that comes from dan and then, probably... yeah, i'll answer that one first I was going to say it probably is more common for them to want to but i still wouldn't be put off applying just be really strong on your personal statement and show that you've explored so you know it, all right some universities are going to be a bit picky and will want to but there'll be plenty out there who if you can demonstrate you know what 
I've done one science, I've done pretty well at it. I've also pushed myself to go and do some work experience um, at a, a local hospital. I've gone and sat in and done a couple of sort of days with a local physio. Those are the sorts of things that I'm looking at. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And then a uh, question from Zoe. As a sports physiotherapist, can you choose to specify in just one sport? Or how common is it that physios move from between sports? Ah, yeah, da, 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 da. well, I've worked in one sport for 30 years. So I'm probably not that common, to be honest with you. And, you know, I know a few of my colleagues who are my sort of age where we have actually worked in one sport for a number of years. Um, I think there are an increasing number of people who will look to work from one sport to another. And even if they're not working from one sport to another, they will look to learn from other sports. So just being into football, just being into cricket is really limiting your thinking as a physiotherapist. I learn loads from the rugby people. I learn the cricketers, they get a lot of bad backs through the bowlers twisting and that's So I really want to learn from the people who look after gymnastics. And I'll go along and sort of see what's going on there. So, you know, there'll be some who will stay at one sport, there'll be plenty who go cross sport, but I hope that everyone thinks of learning from all sport. Yeah. No, OK, no, th thank you. Good answer. And then a uh, sort of related line to that one. And this is really looking at the expansion of um, sports physiotherapy that Daniel asked as a, as a hockey player. Are there many job opportunities within that field? Now, I appreciate you can't answer for every different sport that's out there, but do some sports lend themselves to having more perhaps specialist physios in there or perhaps anything you may, may know about um, hockey? Sure. Well, there'll be plenty of jobs within hockey. It's just whether there are plenty of funded jobs within hockey. So, you know, pretty much every hockey club up and down the country at a certain level will want to have a physiotherapist attached with them. It's how that attachment works. So do I see lots of hockey clubs having a full time group of two or three physiotherapists? No. Um, in fact, I'm not sure many hockey clubs will have one full time physiotherapist unless they're at international level. Um, but there will be physiotherapy practices that will then provide a service to the local hockey club. So unlike my sport of cricket or football, I don't think there are going to be many physiotherapists who are full time with, for example, Hartford Hockey Club um, or even Hartford Rugby Club. It's just the funding's not available at a certain level. And in some sports, there's obviously more money than in others. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, Pearl's asked a really good question. It's, it's changing direction slightly, but I think, I think it's a really good question. How has technology changed your career and what type of technology do you use in your job? Sure. Well, I'll tell you what, it's changed it just by doing this this afternoon. I mean, you know, I, I'm an old fogey. The thought of me zooming and connecting and hanging out and all these other sort of things is a bit bizarre. But funnily enough, you're starting to do that with your clients now, um, because possibly the most, well, physiotherapy is a sensory career. You use your eyes to look, you use your hands sometimes to feel what's going on, you use your brain to think about it, and you talk to people. Now, I, I can talk through technology, I can see through technology, I can, you know, you can almost in a way examine people aside from that touch component through technology. So I think it's something, whether it's physiotherapy or, or other forms of medical practice, we're going to have to get used to this form of interaction that we're on this afternoon. The other thing that I find particularly useful is, um, in terms of technology, is, is a camera. So having the ability to just get my phone and being able to take a film of someone, for example, running is brilliant because I can just slow it down immediately and I can look at it and I can look at the gait patterns and I can look at the asymmetries and we can look at it together. So, you know, we, we I learn and we can also teach our patients and our clients uh, about what's going on. So if I was allowed one bit of technology, it would be a decent camera that allows me to slow stuff down. Yeah, no, I'm sure, of course, any form of sports analysis as well, that, that equally is a really good tool. I mean, take us behind the curtain a little bit at Lord. So, you know, the most iconic cricket ground in the world. The pavilion is, what, nearly 250 years old. When you first set foot in there professionally 30 years ago, what's the difference between then and now to the facilities that are available? It's unbelievable. So there's facilities and their attitudes as well. I'll start with the attitudes. When I started, 
pre-season training was basically who could run to the pub quickest at lunchtime. It's now very, very different. Um, cricket's a long day. You start first class cricket, you start at 11 in the morning, you have a break for lunch, then you have afternoon session and a break for tea. But if I talk you through the nutrition that we used to have at lunchtime, it included bottles of beer on the table in the middle of a first class professional game. <laughs> um, it, you know, that just doesn't happen anymore. So the whole, the, the changes have been colossal in terms of people's attitude to what they eat, how they sleep, how they exercise, how they train, um, how they evaluate technique and tactics, the facilities in the indoor training area now to, to we've got force plates in the floor so we can see how people land and jump. We can slow-mo video a whole load of stuff. We've got machines that can imitate Shane Warne's bowling. Um, the physio facility used to be one room that you could just about squeeze a bed in and walk around. We've now got a beautiful training area. Um, you know, it's increased in size by about six, seven times. You know, for, for cricket, it's, it's totally different from where it was 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, and I'm sure that's replicated across other professional sports as, as well. They're all on probably similar trajectories and, and journeys, I'm, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, right. Well, let's sort of get into the sort of nitty gritty and what your daily routine looks like as a physio. So what are the working conditions? So anyone that's aspiring to become a, a physiotherapist, what's the reality of it? What sort of person does this career suit and who would it not suit? And you know, what's it actually like to be a physiotherapist? What are the conditions like? Well, I need, I need two answers here. So there's one about sport and there's one about physio. OK, so. There is a possibility that you could have a nine to five, eight to four job in your local hospital and have a series of patients that you see every 20 minutes, half an hour, or you could be working around the wards and you have a set workload, Monday to Friday, um, and then you might be on call one weekend every six. In sport, you need to be a bit more flexible than that. Um, you know, sport tends to happen at weekends. So if, you, if you're not interested in working on a Saturday or a Sunday, maybe not the right idea for you and it's incredible how many people have turned up for interview they've gone oh, i didn't realize i had to work at a weekend and you thought pretty obvious um that's what that's when we play um so you've got to be flexible people don't choose to be injured injuries happen and, and you never know when they're going to happen it could be they're going to happen with the last ball of the day in a cricket match it's quarter to seven on a friday night you plan to go out and see your mates and this has happened to me, someone gets injured and I get in at maybe one or two in the morning because I've had to actually look after that person, take them to hospital, be there when they're getting their scans done, you know, take them home because they're unable to drive, explain everything to their family, and then you get back at two. And, you know, the rest of, rest of my family's gone out for a meal on a Friday evening. It's, you, you just got to be flexible and you've got to be adaptable. You never yeah. know what's around the corner. Okay. Um, what's the worst injury you've had to deal with? I've had people dislocate and fracture their ankles so that their foot's pointing in not quite the right direction. That's always a bit dramatic. Uh, I think yeah. one of the ones that I always reflect on that sort of amuses me, and I'm going to name someone here, and it's it's in the public domain, so I'm not going to break any confidentialities here. But Middlesex were playing. Um, uh, were playing a match at Laws once and Mike Gatting was run out on 90 odd and he walked back to the dressing room up the stairs you have to go up two flights of stairs to get back to your dressing room at Laws and in those days there was um, glass in the door and he wasn't a happy bunny and he just put a good little right hook into the door um, but it was a bit too good and his arm went through and he ended up lacerating the whole of his forearm he ended up getting about 26 stitches in here. And it was it just looked like a scene out of, I don't know, Freddy Krueger. It, it was just some bloodbath. So I was wearing a white tracksuit that pitched on the back of the newspapers with me just splattered in blood trying to get this to stem it from uh, going all over the place. And I think it was on a bank holiday Monday. So we had to get him down to the to the NHS facility and it, oh, it, was, it was chaos. So that was that one was 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 a dramaticish injury. Yeah, no. So someone who's squeamish need not apply, I guess. You're going to well, be yeah, like that. yeah, um, yeah. 
And I've also had to defibrillate people on the, you know, in the crowd at Lords. So we've had spectators having a heart attack. And in the early days, again, in county cricket, we were pretty ambitious. We we put in place a defibrillator. We were the first um, cricket club to do it. And someone had a heart attack about six weeks after we put in place. And so I had to defibrillate him whilst play was going on. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we, we he he came back. We got him back. So that was that was that was nice. Yeah. Well, I'm interested in a follow up question to that. How often do you have to top up your training, and and how often is does sort of the, the the medical advice and the procedures change over time that you almost have to relearn certain things? Yeah, that's a, that's a really really good question. So it, when you qualify, that's the starting point. And you're not, you you learn every single year. In fact, if you don't learn pretty much every day, you've missed something. So there's the informal learning that you get from building your experience up. But then as a professional organisation, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy will ask people to do, um, I think it's a minimum of 25 hours a year of what's called continual professional development. You know, people do research because we want to try and improve the way things are going. And if I did exactly the same as I did in 1988 when I qualified, um, that, that's not going to be so good. So, yeah, you learn all the time. But I would also say it's not about just ripping up your knowledge from the past. You add to your knowledge. Uh, and, and that's what's exciting. And you, you mould your knowledge. Uh, OK. We've got some more questions that have come in. I'm going to try and link them in as we come later down. So if you put a question and I haven't read it out yet, I am definitely, definitely going to read it out. Um, this is why slightly connected. What are the biggest rewards and the biggest challenges in becoming a physiotherapist? I think one of the biggest rewards is people often say thank you. Actually, it's really nice and they say it genuinely. People are very, very grateful. If someone, you know, if, if you've helped a sports person resume their career, they're going to say a big, big thank you. And you build some incredible friendships up. And those friendships are, are built around trust. The player's trusting you to help them. You're trusting your skills as well. So the biggest rewards would be the friendships. It would be the thank yous. Um, in cricket, it certainly isn't the money, that's for sure. Um, it will be the camaraderie, it will be a sense of satisfaction uh, of seeing your work go out and achieve things. I remember there's one player, international player who was with Middlesex, who I worked on pretty much every single day for a year. And then when he goes back and plays a test match and wins Man of the Match award, there was a tear in my eye, without a doubt. So those, th those are the biggest rewards. Um, yeah. The other part of the question was challenges. Yeah. Yeah. What are the bits you might perhaps don't like about the job or? There are not many, to be honest with you. There are not many. I mean, you know, time is a challenge in certain sports. You have to give a heck of a lot of time. Um, so if, you, if you're really into your life away from your work, I would say sport, professional sports physiotherapy is, is potentially not one for you. Travelling a lot sounds glamorous and maybe for the first year or two it's fun but gee going and checking into the holiday inn in derby for the fifth time that year is they're, they're better things yeah. to do in your life so there are some challenges yeah okay. and there's a very pertinent question that's come in around rewards here you may not necessarily know the answer to this one Simon but you might have provide some light on it how much do physiotherapists make I mean have you got any idea what the sort of starting salary might be from coming out of university when you first achieve that chartered status and go to the top end level what would you expect um, um, the FA to be paying their head physio or, or the ECB I to imagine okay so <laughs> It, it will partly depend where you are geographically in the country because there's something called London waiting. But I'm going to assume that we're in London. I'm going to assume that we're central London and you're probably looking at a starting salary of late 20s, uh, maybe just early 30s. OK, in central London as an NHS physiotherapist. Um, if you stay in the NHS, it gets a little bit complicated because you could just continue to be what I would call a functioning physiotherapist doing physiotherapy and then you'll probably get to a ceiling of around about 50 something like that 
but you might have the opportunity to go on management or leadership training courses. And there are lots of physios who now who become leaders within hospital trusts. And they were, you know, they 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 could be earning um, you know, close to, to six figures. There'll be certain physios who really specialize, for example, let's say in spinal pain, and they're they're known as extended scope practitioners. And they, you know, some of those will be earning sort of probably close to 70,000. Uh, in sports. I'd imagine most of the premiership boys, well, they'll be on six figures and they do very, if they're with a good team and they've got a good contract, they'll be getting a bonus because the team will be winning a lot. Um, in cricket, you know, the, it, it, there's a range across the country, um, but we're not six figures. But, we, you know, we're, 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 we're not a million miles away. No, okay. I mean, just for just for context, the average national salary across all em, em, employees is about twenty eight thousand pound a year. That's the sort of the average across all workers mm. in the country. So you can benchmark against that. Um, I suppose question related more to the challenges. I might be taking you right back to your sort of just you, your very early days in physiotherapy. That comes from Pearl again. What are some of the challenges of working with geriatric patients? Um. They can be quite exciting challenges on reflection, but that's maybe maybe it is on reflection. You know, geriatric patients they don't always think clearly, so you've got the challenges of potentially dementia and psychological um, conditions that sit alongside the sort of musculoskeletally and the frailty type conditions. You know, elderly people have multiple what's what's called multiple morbidities. It's rare for someone just to have one problem. You know, they often have arthritis plus a bit of heart failure plus maybe a bit of dementia and and that's what makes it a very you know tricky thing to work out exactly how you deal with them um sometimes uh, you know those conditions of the mind lead to a patient being angry um sometimes it, they can be incredibly reclusive so there are lots of real challenges of working with the elderly when the multimorbidities exist get it right it's really exciting well you said about the satisfaction of just having someone say thank you to it and I, I guess those sorts of rewards so it's one thing um i'm looking after a cricketer who's going to go on and score 100 for england because of the rehabilitation that you've given him but also to to allow an older patient the ability to walk again and the sorts of gratitude you must get not just from the patient but from the family as well must be must be right up there mustn't it Absolutely, it's a really good point, Gareth. You know, it's just the thanks you get from the other people who are involved, and it, you know that often is the family, um, where an elderly person can sometimes be a, a burden. Yeah, no, okay. uh, just to just come back to the question about the um, the salary, and this is something that all of you are able to do. The website that we use called Hop, which is www.hop, H O P, which stands for Hertfordshire Opportunities Portal, um, into Within that, there's a careers directory, and that will provide you um, general information from across the country about average salaries from different professions. So if you put physiotherapy in there, it would it, it would tell you that one. But I will remind everyone of that before they go as well. And um, the other question that was, I guess, connected to that that Tom's asked is, is it highly competitive getting into physiotherapy? Again, if we could maybe address that from from a couple of angles. One. I don't know how much you know about UCAS applications for, for physiotherapy. And then that next filter point, I guess, of, of people coming through um, the system at university and going into going into the field of physiotherapy. And then put out from a personal experience. So last time or next time you go out to recruit, how many applications or credible applications do you expect to receive? So, so getting into university has become increasingly competitive over the last uh, 15 years and the, the, the grade attainments have increased without a doubt. Um, that said, I, I, I do think there is a bit of a tide shift towards the paramedical professions becoming popular and more places will be being encouraged by the government. So I think if you want to do physiotherapy and you're capable of getting the grades, you should be able to find a place somewhere up and down the country. I think once you've yeah. got your degree, there are lots of jobs. You know, that you should not be out of a job. You might have to work in a different part of the country. There might not be one on your doorstep, but physiotherapists are required. So that side of things, not too competitive. 
in terms of getting into elite sport, um, that's tougher. And typically, if I would, be, if I advertise for a physiotherapist to come and join us at Lords, I'd expect to get at least 100, 150 applications. Um, in terms of the relevant ones that I'd look at, we're probably down to about 30 or 40. And I think you also need to be prepared that if you're going to go into sort of top level sport, you're probably going to need to not just do your basic degree, but also look to get a master's qualification now. That might be a filtration process that some of the clubs do. You know, they might not even look at you unless you have a master's. I'm not sure I agree with that, but just the way it is in some places. Okay. And then we've got a sort of question connected to this from Amir. For someone who wants to be a sports physio, would you suggest going into the NHS and working up, then eventually specialising or going straight into sports physio? Uh, if an opportunity comes your way, go take it. However, don't underestimate what being in the NHS for two or three years can do. It's an incredible way to learn about communication, teamwork, um, getting on with other disciplines. And do you know what? That's exactly what you do in sport. So, but, you know, so then again, if, if an opportunity is just on your, on your doorstep, take it. Yeah, well, I mean, just thinking about the sort of supply and demand of, of physios, do you see this as being a you know a growth area? Or are we going to be looking for more physios as we go forward? In fact, the question that's come in from um, Josh, which is with modern society, is there an increasing demand for physiotherapists? I, I think um, if you'd asked me the question 10 years ago, I'd have said probably not. But if you ask it, me today, I'd go, yes, there is. I think the way the health services have been potentially restructured you know not 10 years ago if you had back pain you went to see a doctor the doctor then referred you to potentially a physio or an x-ray or, or something else nowadays if you've got back pain you go and see the physio before you even see the doctor so mm -hmm. if i'm honest with you why because it's a cheaper form of labor for hospitals it's but also it's possibly more effective because there's more specialism straight away so I think there's going to be an increasing demand for physiotherapists over the next 10 years. Okay, um, taking this on perhaps a slightly different angle now, looking at your particular career path, you've set up your own company, Optima Life. So why did you decide to set up your own company and what are the benefits of doing it that way as opposed to just being an employee of, of Lord's Cricket Ground or the MCC? Yeah, well, I, you know, I've always been a little bit of a scallywag. I've always tried to be ahead of the curve a touch and, and, and thought, how can I push myself further? So at the same time as looking after the cricket, I set up Optima Life or I set up a physiotherapy practice. I grew that. And then about 12 years ago, I set up Optima Life. And Optima Life is, is probably a classic example of a physiotherapist looking a little bit out of the window of physiotherapy, but seeing where the skills go in another, another direction. So I spent a lot of my time now working with businesses and talking to them about what I call the human and the humane side of performance. How can you as a as someone who works in a business or a leader, look after yourself, look after your people, be a catalyst for well-being um, and, and health across the organization. Um, and I guess the other thing I've always tried to do is, is keep myself interested in different ways of delivery and if i set up my own business and i take control of that the obstacles aren't in the way but it's not for everyone yeah no i can't that's obviously goes wider than looking at physiotherapy doesn't it that's almost yeah. any walk of life it's an entrepreneurial mindset so yeah. it's, it's an entrepreneurial mindset and but you know physiotherapy can allow you to utilize an entrepreneurial mindset if you've got it yeah Right. And another question here. When you're, and this will answer a couple of questions that have um, that have come in. When you're employing a physiotherapist, obviously you want to see that they've got the degree. You want to see that they're um, that they're, they're chartered. But what are the most important skills or qualities that you're looking for? Um, honesty, open-mindedness, um, and acceptance that you, you know we none of us know it all. We all learn every single day. Um, I always ask people when I interview them, you know, sort of talk me through some of the mistakes you've got in your life, you've had in your life. Because if you're able to sort of just talk people through and, and, and reflect on those, then you're going to grow. It's having that sort of ability, ability to grow as a person and grow as a mind that, that, that we're always looking for. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, just in terms of, sort of the baseline qualification, the question come in yeah. about whether there's an apprenticeship in physiotherapy or is this very much the traditional journey that you, you've really got to go to university and get the degree first? I think you do, to be honest, if you're going to become a chartered physiotherapist. I mean, there are a number of people who will go and do sports therapy and then we'll do a one year conversion course. So you'll go and they'll do a sports therapy course and then they'll look at doing a one year master's conversion. And then that allows you to become a chartered physiotherapist. But in terms of a, 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 what I would consider a traditional apprentice type scheme, not that I'm aware of, but maybe there's some things I'm not aware of. Yeah, no, okay. and then I mean we probably covered this already. But Tom asked, "What I mean, what's the best route to becoming a physio?" And before I, I ask you to answer that question, another one which I, th I think perhaps is probably related is Izzy asks, "What sort of work experience is best?" And um, this possibly might allude to the fact is that as an employer, how important is it to you that you know someone's perhaps done some volunteering or has perhaps spent some invested some of their own time into learning and finding out a bit a little bit more about the profession i think it's pretty important to be honest these days you know as an employer you're, you're differentiating yourself to me and sorry i'm going to give you a little secret here folks but as someone who interviews people you've given me something to ask you about i, I we, we've got we've got a chat going because i see something i did this and i volunteered on that blimey that's great we've got to have a little chat about that so you'll make my job easier as an interviewer, let alone an employer. I, I think it's important. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, in, in terms of any sort of formal work experience, would that be covered within the, the the degree that someone would have to do that they would have that level of actual experience being in the in in the workplace, or is there any yeah, sure. additional work experience that could be gained? So before you do the degree, it's really it's it's really useful to have um, probably gone and spent some time either at a hospital or in a practice and shown that you've you've engaged with the profession, you understand the profession. When you're training yeah. and you're doing your degree, you will be sent away to various hospitals and do what are called clinical placements, where you observe and you know sometimes you're even let loose and allowed to do the odd thing. Um, but yeah, you're in a position where you are observing actual physiotherapy happening with actual patients um, so yeah you'll get plenty of experience that way yeah and in, in terms of requesting work experience I, I mean I'm, I'm guessing that that you or that sort of big names Tottenham Hotspur or, or, or Arsenal would probably be inundated with requests for work experience and they're probably not going to well they're, they're not going to be able to cater or anywhere near um, the number of requests that they get but perhaps the local physiotherapy clinics and the hospitals Obviously, when we're out of the situation we're in at the moment, um, would that be something you'd recommend and advise? Yeah, local physiotherapy clinics, hospitals, maybe even your local sports club. You know, I mentioned sort of Hartford for some reason earlier, but Hartford Rugby Club, there'll be a physiotherapist who goes there maybe a couple of times a week. So, uh, in St Albans, where I live, at Old Albanians, there'll be a physiotherapist who looks after that rugby club. Um, you know, try and build a relationship with them. And, and a little tip I'd give you is if you have the opportunity to actually go in, or pick up a telephone and speak is so much more human than just dropping an email or some other form of electronic thing. It's, it's so easy. If I get an email in now, I can just go, no. If you come and see me, it's much harder for me to say no. So yeah. don't underestimate that, that, you know, show yourself as a person. It makes a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. No, that's a, that's a that's a good answer. I think it's some sort of pretty important um, lessons to take forward there for everybody. Um, a couple more questions. These are, I guess these are probably quite technical questions that um, you'll understand better than than I will. Um, Maybe. Pearl asked another question. Actually, this one's just come in now. How do you handle situations where patients do suddenly become quite agitated or angry? And I, I guess apply this across the spectrum from your perhaps a, a, an agitated geriatric patient who may be suffering from some form of dement, dementia to your elite sports person. I, I, I guess both of those people would display those um, emotions at times. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that one? Are you, are you trained to deal with that? You're, you're, tra you're trained to deal with having difficult conversations and you'll be trained to deal with conflict. You know, a, a patient who's got severe dementia could suddenly lash out. That is possible. And you need to be prepared to go to the processes so if someone does lash out you will be trained and, and the first thing you've got to do is look after yourself 
So that's the first thing you do. Um, and I don't mean look after yourself physically, I mean just make sure you're safe and, and you know, seek help and, and get the appropriate advice. Um, at a professional, uh, you know, in a professional sport, there's some really, really tough conversations you have to have. You know, if you're telling someone that their career's over, age 24, um, who's on the verge of playing an international sport, that's a really tough conversation to have. And you've got the anger of the player, you've got the anger of the potentially the parents. And I think you just have to, they're not angry with you, you've got to accept that, they're angry with the situation. And I think you have to empathise with the situation and give people the time. And almost think, well, how would I like to be treated if that was me? And it's those times when the textbook doesn't always help. You've, you've got to be adaptable in the way that you deal with human beings. That's one of the quite exciting things about the profession is you know, people are different, which means you have to treat them differently. Um, but yeah, there, there are tough times and they're tricky conversations to have. But you'll be encouraged to reflect on the way you deal with those. You'll be given ideas of how to, to uh, implement those conversations. You know, I encourage people to rehearse them as well and think about the different ways the conversation could go. In the same way, rehearse a whole load of other things in life. Yeah. Yeah, no, okay. Um, different question or different sort of question that's coming from Josh. And do you practice manual therapy techniques or do you rely on machines? I guess that comes back to how technology has changed over the years. I use these things more than anything. <clears throat> so actually, when I qualified, Machines were very, very fashionable. You know, I, I, if I go back five years before I qualified, it was something called the magic sponge. And then we moved into the realms of the freeze spray. You just sprayed everything. And then there were lots of machines that you put people into. And, and then actually my era is about hands. It's about manipulation. It's about manual therapy, um, it's about influencing tissue with hands. And, and physios nowadays, there'll be a combination of probably hands and then rehabilitation skills in terms of really sort of working muscles in different ways and different timing patterns, getting things to move slightly differently. So uh, that, that gives you a little bit of a history lesson on physiotherapy and shows you how the professions evolved. But me, hands and talking. Yeah, no, very, very, very important. Um, so a pertinent question that's coming from Finley here. Has the current situation affected your daily work? Now, I guess you know, four months ago, you might have expected to be in the pavilion at Lords at the moment, or somewhere on the somewhere on the circuit, and here you are talking to us. So, I mean, how does it affect? How are you trying to treat and um, manage players' injuries at the moment? Well, sports it's impacted dramatically. So, um, Middlesex went away on a pre-season tour to Amman at the beginning of uh, March which was pretty much just when lockdown was being talked about. We, uh, they came back early uh, because they sort of preempted that lockdown was going to happen. Um, they came back a little bit early. And since they've been back, we haven't had contact with them apart from this sort of media. So the only contact I have with people or, or, or any of the sports science or, or medicine, medical department has is through Zoom. Um, the players are furloughed at the moment. Um, at, at Middlesex. Um, they're encouraged to train, but we've got no right to tell them what to do if they're furloughed. Um, although the point is made that you know you might not be furloughed soon, and if you come back to staying overweight, you're not doing yourself many favours. Um, so we're having to interact with them totally differently. But we were very fortunate. We, we had a pretty clean bill of health at the beginning of the season. We didn't have too much that needed lots of hands-on treatment. So that hasn't been compromised uh, massively. Um, but we, the physio, so the head physio, Pete, um, who works for me, he now, he's now, he will ring every player and have a conversation for about half an hour every week to see how they're going mentally, physically, and, and just provide them both with support, encouragement, and keep the tabs on it for management as well. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that he's talking to them. It's not necessarily about the physical condition; it's about the mental condition as well. And how has that developed? Where the you know our awareness of mental health has has grown perhaps exponentially over the last few years. I think it's probably still a very long way for us to go with that. But how has that affected your role as a you know as a physiotherapist? Was mental health something that was even talked about or considered 30 years ago? 
I don't think it was talked about it, you know, as 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 mental health, but it was certainly the psychological component was certainly acknowledged. Um, and you know, I mentioned earlier that you know I, I I use talking to help people a lot because if you can explain things to people and desensitize the fear that's often in people who are in pain, um, that often really helps the pain levels without even touching them or manipulating them or getting them to do an exercise. You can influence things dramatically by just desensitizing the brain. Um, and I think the other thing from a med, I'm gonna let, let's just also clarify, in my view, mental health isn't just about poor mental health, it's also about great mental health. If I'm working with a player, I need to have those skills that allow me to motivate the person to want to do the exercises, to do them better, to be the best they possibly can. It's a competitive world out there in sport. If you're not doing it, do you know what? Someone else is not going to be far behind you. So how do we motivate you? And, and again, that's an area that I really love because you've got to use different techniques with different personalities. Yeah, okay. I've got one more question due to us. So if anyone has got any more questions they want to ask Simon, please drop them in now. So there's one more question and then we'll we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, so the question is, there's another one around work experience. So, so Lewis asks, um, what's the best time to get work experience? I guess the, the best part of the year. Um, bear in mind that you know all schools will have a perhaps a slightly different window when they do it formally. But I think we're we're talking more about work experience the young person might get off their own off their own back. So it, again, perhaps thinking from your own experiences, when would be the best time for someone to approach you in the professional sports field, um, and when might be the best time to approach your local physiotherapy clinic or your local sports club, if indeed there is a, a better time to do it. Okay, yeah, I think you need to think about the sport that you may be approaching because they'll have different cycles depending on the time of year. Um, it, in cricket, I know I get a lot of people writing to me sort of in March because it's sort of suddenly come up, you need to do something in the summer about your career. Um, you, you need to go and think about a work experience week or a work experience day. Um, I actually prefer it if people come and see me in the summer and arrange something for the next year. So it's almost a year in advance from when you need to be doing it. Um, it also gives you time to chip away at me and, and keep nagging me and going, come on, you know, so we do it. And you know what, if there's anything that yeah. crops up earlier, um, that would be great. Um, so think about the sport, think about the demands on the sport, respect the person might be very busy. And just because you've gone along once and they give you the brush off and say, look, not right now, don't not go along again. In fact, if you come along again, I'm probably going to go, blimey, this chat really is keen or this, but this, this, this girl really, really wants to do this. Um, yeah. So sometimes you've got to be a bit of a persistent so-and-so. Yeah. Well, I think you made a very good point earlier that just by sending an email, even if it's supposedly the right time of the year, that might not get very far, but someone turns up on your, you know, on, on your door and asks you the question in person or picks up the phone and, and rings you, that likely to go further than the speculative Absolutely. email. And think of the network you might have. If you think long and hard, there's probably someone you know or your family knows or a friend of someone in your family knows who has an association with someone who's a physiotherapist. And if they can do a little introduction and say, oh, can, can Pearl, because Pearl's asking a lot of questions, can Pearl come along and spend a half day with you? It's much harder for me to say that to a friend, to say no to a friend than someone that I've never met before. So think of the network yeah. you have. It's a really useful skill to think about. I mean, the other bit of advice that I'd perhaps give to everyone is think about when your school's work experience takes place, which I, I know isn't happening at the moment. Um, I think most of the Stevenage schools all do work experience in um, June or July. So you think about the amount of requests there are from six or seven different schools. I think they often do work experience around the same sort of time. So the questions are all being asked to those employees at the, at the same sort of time. So it's very easy for them to say no. Whereas perhaps if you ask during the school holidays when there aren't any schools, asking at the time then chances are you can have a bit more of a free run to it as well so just think about when your school operates work experience and if you want to do it in addition to that um, then just try and work it work it into a part of the timetable that it is that isn't affected by that because there's nothing worse than being inundated with requests that you just can't handle whereas you say one day where you've perhaps not had any requests for a few weeks and business is a little bit quieter than usual that might be exactly the right time mm. um, 
to to get that. Okay, right. Well, there's there's no further questions coming, so I'm I'm going to assume all everyone that's wanted to ask questions. And there's been some really fantastic questions today, so thanks for submitting. Thanks for submitting those. This video, um, this has been broadcast, so it has been recorded, and we will put it onto our website so that it can be accessed at any later point for any of you that are on it at the moment, or you can share it as well um, with any of your, your colleagues or your school friends that maybe would be interested to listen to some of the very important information that Simon's given you. On your screen at the moment, um, you can see what I understand is called a QR code. Um, my understanding of this is if you take a picture of that QR code with your phone, that will direct you to um, a variety of our various social media handles that we've got that will give you direct access a to this video um, which will probably go up about five o'clock this evening and then it will be on there so it'll be available via our youtube channel um, you'll also be able to see details for any of our other previous sessions that we've run which have been on very different careers and different industries and ones that we've got that are forthcoming as well so can i just first of all thank all of our participants for logging in and, and thank you to your um, your careers teachers within your schools for inviting you and getting you to come onto this we will send you a, a short evaluation just to find out how useful you think this has been but hopefully you find it really inspiring and and it's really sparked your interest in looking even further into physiotherapy as a career and hopefully you've learned some really good tips as well from from simon so as an actual employer and somebody who's been in physiotherapy for uh, for a very long time and um, there's some really really valuable lessons for you on here but finally can i thank simon uh, ever so much for giving up your time um for us today and for talking to us and for explaining in such detail some of the insights that you've got that hopefully um many of the attendees and people that are watching this today will be your peers in a few years time will be joining you in the uh, physiotherapy field pleasure and, and go well everyone it's, it's been good fun thanks for the questions okay thanks very much stay safe everybody look forward to seeing from you again soon